Supposedly, Republican politics switched from pro-civil rights with Lincoln to racist by the 1960s, and that's why the South now consistently votes Republican instead of Democrat, like before. The switch that I think is more interesting, and it is certainly factual, is that the polit modern political left's voting bloc includes the Northeastern states, which once were solidly Republican and the center of the abolitionist movement. The heart of this very real switch could be the social gospel, a Christian heresy that gained prominence in American Protestant churches in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Between 1890 and 1920, the social gospel infiltrated prestigious seminaries and universities in the northeastern United States, and then Princeton University's former president, Woodrow Wilson, carried it with him into the White House in the, after the 1912 election. Francis Greenwood Peabody taught the social gospel at Harvard University and founded the ethics department there. He also advocated ecumenism and the unity of faiths. Walter Rauschenbusch taught at Rochester Theological Seminary, and Thomas C. Hall and later Harry Ward taught it at Union Theological Seminary. Both Hall and Rauschenbusch felt that the focus of Jesus' teaching had been lost and advocated social improvement through charity and generosity. It placed emphasis on Christian living or works. Uh, Rauschenbusch felt that the church could only survive if it was actively involved in the social reform movements of the day. Harry Ward, who had been Peabody's research assistant at Harvard University, uh, made his mark as a social gospel preacher in Chicago, then taught ethics at Union Theological Seminary, and was the American Civil Liberties Union president for, or national chairman, national chairman for 20 years. Now, what I found most interesting in my research, though, was learning, or maybe relearning, Woodrow Wilson's uh, firm and very conservative faith in Christ as a redemptive savior, which is allowed the norm for social gospelers. Indeed, he went on a philosophical journey, so to speak, to become the father of one of the fathers of the modern left. In 1879, he had actually lamented the concentration of power in congressional committees, feeling that it eroded the power of the voters who had put the congressmen in office. There were signs, though. He already felt that education was the duty of government for the benefit of government due to the responsibility of the people to manage the affairs of the government through their vote. Uh, and he also stated that a direct result of education was that it pulled people out of poverty. Uh, he taught history and political economics at Bryn Mawr College and then at Wesleyan University uh, before moving to Princeton University in 1890 to teach jurisprudence and political theory. So he became president Princeton in 1902, the first person to hold that position who had not been an ordained minister. In that position, he went after the social clubs, uh, initiating universal dining halls and allowing uh, college, the college administration to restrict students to their quads after curfew for the purpose of uh, forcing finan the financially well-off to associate with the less well-off. Uh, in a 1904 baccalaureate address uh, with, that was just filled with uh, uh, religious language, uh, he stressed service and activism upon the graduates as their duty uh, and stated that they were going out in the spirit of God. And despite all this talk about the spirit of God and duty and purpose, never once brought up salvation or, or eternal matters. Lest you think he had forgotten about such matters, though, he brought up uh, introducing the next generation to Christ as the purpose, the explicit purpose of Christian education on a speech in Pittsburgh about Christian education. Late in 1906, he would reject income tax as a policy, but he also thought tariff law was the government for... Uh, it was the government favoring certain industries over others and thereby picking in win winners and losers. It also lamented uh, the role, the size of monopolies and big corporations, not just because 
he felt they threatened human rights, but because he felt that they threatened the power of the government. Um, of course, in 1913, uh, he favored the 16th, he advocated for the 16th Amendment, and uh, upon his assuming the presidency later that year, he uh, signed into law, progressive income tax law.